scriptures by the privileged classes. Or since the caste system was established in many Hindu societies many centuries ago. Although Hinduism, Hinduism promoted tolerance, non-discrimination was not and still is not a central tenet of Hinduism. There are still deep-rooted practices of discrimination against women and the abhorrent treatment of people from the fourth caste, often referred to as the Dalits in Nepal or Harijans by Gandhi in India. The Vedic idea of the division of society was based on the division of labor or professions according to functional cooperation and was different from that of the federal uh, federation of tribal and occupational groups of later ages, known as the caste system. This division of labor introduced disparity in wealth, education, and intellectual attainment between the different classes. The upper classes spent more time on intellectual activities and enjoyed the privileges that came with their intellectual professions. It was only later on during the Puranic period that Hindu scriptures divided society into different castes, creating an unequal society and, releg and relegating people belonging to the lower castes to an inferior status. That's a much later development within Hinduism. If you go back to the much earlier scriptures, the Vedas, you do find no such distinction or discrimination against the people of lower classes. The caste system is still prevalent in many traditional societies in India and Nepal, the two most prominently Hindu states. These practices have been outlawed in modern times in both of these countries and the constitution and laws of these countries guarantee, guarantee equality before the law and make all, all fundamental freedoms available to all on equal footing. However, discriminatory practices, practices still exist in society because many regard the laws of the state as a secondary to their Hindu beliefs. Women and Dalits, including Harijans, still suffer enormously in more traditional Hindu societies. Much work remains to be done to enact major reforms to the practices of traditional Hindu societies relating to the caste system and the atrocious practices of untouchability. What we need, in my opinion, is to update the code of Manu, also known as the code of life or the Manusmriti, which was written by a Sanskrit scholar, most likely by a group of scholars under the leadership of sage Manu around the 6th century BC. While the Rig Veda was composed in 1450 BC, Manusmriti was composed much later, after nearly 1000 years. This is a work of genius, no doubt, but it institutionalized the discriminatory caste system within Hinduism. The caste system has deeply troubled me for many years. There is a need for a modern version of the Manusmriti that incorporates modern principles of human rights. Having a national constitution that guarantees equality before the law and ratifying human rights treaties are ways to encourage reform. However, attempting to reform centuries-old beliefs is quite another matter. The discriminatory caste system is deeply rooted in the psyches of those traditional societies and the enactment of new political laws alone will not bring about the desired change. Rather, laws must also be accompanied by the reform and modernization of the scriptures. I would need to mobilize a large member of scholars within the Hindu world to accomplish this task and I am on the lookout for such scholars. If any one of you would like to join me in my mission, I would welcome you. To conclude, if we are looking for a modern human rights language in ancient Hindu and the Buddhist scriptures, we will not find them. But if we are looking for the early foundational principles of human rights in Buddhism and Hinduism, these can be found in abundance. This is shared cultural heritage integrating Eastern and Western thinking adds further legitimacy to the universality of human rights and demonstrates how beneficial principles from Christian and non-Christian heritage can come together to further the advancement of human civilization and strengthen the notion of universality of human rights. Thank you for your kind attention.
thank you, Professor Subedi, for your insightful lecture. Uh, that was indeed a novel perspective on human rights. Human rights have been a very contested issue, and today's lecture has sought to clarify some of these ongoing debates. I'm sure that the audience is brimming with questions. But before that, I would like to take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions which I think might add on to the nuance of the lecture. Uh, so firstly, Professor Subedi, what inspired you to write this book? And uh, the second question, how do you think this book contributes to the current mission of decolonizing academia or say even globalizing international relations? And uh, the third question is, so you know, we all, most of us here are academics and we tend to write a lot. We have a group of students from LSCPPE Society here and they have the reading week, they have a lot of essays to answer. We often face this writer's block. So uh, I'm wondering if you had such a face to encounter and how did you deal with writer's block? Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Uh, what uh, troubled me for some time was the caste system, the discriminatory practices. Although outlawed by the constitution, various laws have been enacted in both India and Nepal, but the system is still persist, exists in many societies. What is this? Where does it come from? Is it the religious teaching or simply the practices? That's what I wanted to study, the religious scriptures, going as far back as 1450 BC, when the Rig Veda was composed. That's the origin of Hinduism. The values were outlined in the Rig Veda, where you don't find such discrimination. Only later, nearly 1000 years later, when the Manusmriti was composed, then the society was getting better organized by the standards of the day. There were cities growing, population was growing. So Manusmriti, the sage Manu, wanted to come up with a code of conduct for individuals, code of conduct for governance, how the king should govern the country, the relations between the rulers and the rule. And then this was also strengthened in the Kautilya Arthashastra. Having written, soon after the Manusmriti was uh, promulgated, Arthur Shastra does the same thing. Then I thought I should perhaps analyze it and perhaps argue that caste system is against the core values of Hinduism. And of course, Buddha was a rebel. Many people call him the Protestant of the East. He rebel. He rebel against the Brahmin-dominated Hindu version. Then he promoted the idea of non-violence, non-discrimination and very much egalitarian approach. In doing so, he also relied on the earlier Hindu scriptures, including the Vedas and Upanishads. Upanishads were, the, uh, were composed during the time, time of enlightenment. Nearly 3,000 years ago, people were, still, were already questioning whether God exists. Charvak Darshan has a place in the Mahabharata and many other scriptures. Buddha came up with, the, with this idea of replacing monarchical rule by some sort of federal structure, elected representation, federal parliament. That sort of ideas were already being debated in the 6th century BC. So that was the inspiration. I thought I should go as far as possible. And the another inspiration was the book was written uh, during the COVID pandemic restrictions. I was grounded at home. I had many books. So I relied heavily on the resources that I had at home. So it is the product of the uh, COVID pandemic time. Going back to your uh, Aishwarya's second question, how does this book contribute to the current debate on decolonizing the curriculum? 
Because as I said in my speech, much of the human rights literature, whether academic or reports and other publications of the United Nations, begin the origins of human rights with humanism and renaissance and accelerated during the time of colonial period. Whether you talk about the uh, French Revolution and the French Declaration of Human Rights or the uh, American Declaration of Independence or the result of the Continental Congress, they do not go far back in history to understand how other societies were governed in ancient times. If we are going to say human rights are universal, everybody should respect human rights, we must also understand are, they, are these values emanate from all the major civilizations, all major civilizations, so they have a universal roots, or because the Western societies impose their standards on the rest, and no matter whether there were some elements of human rights in the other civilizations or not, it has come to be accepted as a universal uh, 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 set of rights, and we all should accept it. So I wanted to explore and promote the uh, idea that human rights values existed in other societies, in the distant past, in the scriptures in antiquity, and uh, argue that human rights, as I said in my speech, the core of the human rights agenda of the United Nations can be found in Hindu Buddhist scriptures. They can be found also in some of the Islamic scriptures. For instance, the Charter of Medina, adopted in 2006, nearly 500 years before the Magna Carta was adopted, was equally progressive, if not more progressive. So we need to study the values of other civilizations to strengthen the idea that human rights are universal and they emanate from all major religions and civilizations of the world. Now the third question, Ashwariji, when I have a, a sort of a, um, a, a, some sort of a block, you know, can't write anything. When I was doing my DPhil, called PhD elsewhere, they call it DPhil at Oxford, I used to drop my pen and go to the seaside, spend a day, and perhaps stay in a BNB and come back, re energized, re invigorated, and uh, 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 continue writing. So that has been, and nowadays what I do equally, I am at the University of Leeds. Leeds is a city, very compact, but you just drive two and three miles, four miles, you are out into the countryside. The Yorkshire Dales are my refuge. I go for hiking regularly to the Yorkshire Dales, beautiful place. And that's how I deal with uh, uh, the, the challenges of continuing with my writing. So uh, those of you who want to know how you could do so, go to the seaside, go to the countryside. By the time you come back, blood circulation, fresh oxygen, lungs cleanse, and you will be more productive. Thank you. Uh, now, I would open the floor for questions. I would like you to rec uh, introduce yourself and keep your questions brief. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Swedi. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. It was very, very insightful. I'm Ananya, and I'm a second year PPE student at LSE. I'm the president of the LSE PPE Society. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, my question was, um, was whether you think that there's a space for secular policy making in South Asia at this moment in time, because um, faith and religion is a very like a contentious topic in many South Asian countries. So do you think there's a space for completely objective uh, policy making and policy decision making? Thank you. That's a good question uh, because the point I have been arguing for some time. Um, although the book was published in 2021, I was uh, hoping to have a book launch last year because the co during the COVID pandemic, we couldn't do uh, uh, organize such events. So um, my idea was there is this concept so-called cultural relativism. We Asians are different. Our practices are different. We are different. So if you recall, in the run-up to the Vienna Conference of 1993, some states in mainly in Southeast Asia, supported by China and some other countries, came up with this idea that Asian values are different. And um, these Asian values do not necessarily go hand in hand with Western values, challenging in some way the universality of human rights. But my idea has been, no, the 
early scriptures of both Buddhism and Hinduism. Actually, Buddhism was a state religion in China for 300 years. So many, even the ideas uh, of Shintoism in Japan and other belief systems in other countries in uh, uh, the Far East are deeply influenced by Buddhist teachings. If you look at the religious scriptures of both Hinduism and Buddhism, they are promoting secularism. Worship any god you like. Pray any god you like. As long as you don't interfere with the practices of other people. Secularism has been at the heart of both Hinduism and Buddhism. Therefore, the idea of uh, Asian values and uh, relativist theory, I reject them and say these are the creations of the, the ideas were created by the autocratic rulers of Southeast Asia, South Asia and other parts of Asia to justify the autocratic rule of the country. But if they go back far back in history, their culture and civilization is deeply rooted in secularism. That's what I see. India, for instance, was governed for nearly 600 years by Muslim rulers, nearly 200 years by Christian rulers from Britain. But the Hinduism survived because at the core of Hinduism is personal liberty. You can see in India, Nepal, hundreds of sects, hundreds of groups of all kinds operate. They have been operating since time immemorial. There is no organized religion. You don't have to obey certain things. I can come up with my own menu as a Hindu. I can worship whatever I I can go to the temple every day if I want to. I can go to the temple every week. If I don't want to, I don't even have to go to. I can worship my God in my own way. Therefore, secularism at the, is at the heart of both Hinduism and Buddhism. We need to pro promote that idea. So against the tendencies of non-secular approach in some societies. Thank you. Hi, th hi, thank you for taking out the time to talk with us today. Um, it was a very insightful session. Um, I'm Nandini, I work at the Embassy of Costa Rica. I work as a policy advisor there. Um, I had a question regarding the current Israel-Palestine conflict, and I wanted to know how would you view the current Israel-Palestine conflict from the lens of human rights and civilizational clashes? Thank you. Uh, that is a very interesting and important question. Uh, it's a complex topic. All I would say as an international lawyer, international law should be upheld by everybody, both sides. So even the uh, wars have their own rules. And these rules are known as international humanitarian law. They should be observed in any conflict in any part of the world and including the Middle East. Hi, um, my name is Ananya and I'm also a second year PP undergraduate at LSE. Um, thank you so much for your talk. It was really um, very insightful, particularly regarding the, the decolonization of the understanding of human rights. Um, I had a question about, um, so the caste system and in particular affirmative action or positive discrimination programs. So in India, of course, one of the um, the father of the constitution is of course B.R. Ambedkar, who was himself um, a Dalit. And so there was many, um, in the writing of constitution, there was a real push for equality, particularly equality of opportunity. And they included many affirmative action programs, such as quotas. Um, in modern India today, uh, do you feel like that those affirmative action programs and quotas, which are starting to be quite controversial in many um, cities and many societies, do you feel like they have been able to tackle the structural roots of caste discrimination and do you think they still play, uh, will, they will still continue to play a role um, in society as we go on because they have had an impact in, of course, ensuring equality in government jobs and education, but do you think that they've actually like tackled the systemic roots of caste discrimination? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, the, these are what you are referring to, uh, uh, political measures to address inequality in society, to empower the people from uh, traditionally disadvantaged and deprived backgrounds. In the constitutions of most countries, after outlining fundamental rights and freedoms, mainly in chapter 3 or part 3 of a constitution, 
they will have certain rights listed and then towards the end of it there will be a provision saying that provided or however the state will be free to enact in laws designed to promote in short positive discrimination basically to um, uh, encourage and empower the people from traditionally disadvantaged backgrounds that's what it seems to be happening in india and in other countries as well but i would like to go a bit further than that one as i said in my speech political measures alone have not been enough in traditional societies where people's beliefs are still guided by scriptures like the manusmriti or the artha shastra from the 6th century bc onwards and the discrimination accelerated during the puranic period puranic period is even much later so we need to challenge that uh, uh, sort of a view that um, people hold in traditional societies that uh, political measures decisions taken by the governments laws enacted by parliament constitutions adopted by the country are well and good commendable but that is not enough even after india gaining independence in 1947 nepal embracing democracy in 1990 many people in those societies both women and people from disadvantaged backgrounds still suffer a great deal that is uh, has been troubling me for some time therefore positive discrimination is permissible uh, some rights are absolute some rights are qualified rights so you certain rights right to life i would say absolute right but other rights are qualified rights and the government uh, when adopting the constitution will have further limited the exercise of those rights in favor of the traditionally disadvantaged people and then also of course many society that have done well has been have been by and large meritocratic societies so how far you go what sort of balance you accomplish in the policies and laws of the country that's the something for politicians to consider democracy to survive in my opinion meritocracy merit based system competition fair play and merit are the two i think soul of democracy in my opinion but if you sacrifice meritocracy in the name of uh, positive discrimination then you will be perhaps discouraging people to excel in their own field and make a contribution to society for the betterment of society so there has to be a balance achieved there in the name of achieving political discrimination uh, positive discrimination you should not sacrifice the core principles of merit and fair play or competition we'll take one last question professor and thank you for an illuminating lecture my name is sam bidwell i'm a parliamentary researcher and a law graduate from the university of cambridge uh, in england private property has always been at the core of the way that we've spoken about rights many of the earliest expressions of personal rights in this country were expressed in terms of property rights and the rights of property holders i was wondering if you could shed some light on the role that differing perceptions of land and private property in eastern civilizations have played on the development of human rights context and text in the east thank you yes i agree with you and in eastern civilization for instance in one of my chapters i discuss my work in cambodia when i was the united nations special rapporteur for human rights in cambodia the number one human rights issue in the country was land rights because when the country went through a very difficult period including the rule by the pol pot regime the khmer rouge the brutal regime then after that vietnamese invasion for a good 10 years meant that people fled their homes fled their country fled their city went to went abroad went to remote areas by the time they came back 10 15 years later their land had already been grabbed by other people so number one human rights issue in the country was land rights issue that's what i tackle so in very many eastern societies the land registration land record keeping documentation was not developed therefore in very many societies the, those who were powerful powerful politically economically intellectually grabbed as much land as they could and made other people landless that is a big issue in very many countries so only over the past 30 40 years serious process of land reform has been uh, uh, sort of going on but still the process hasn't gone far enough in my opinion many people especially from the fourth caste the disadvantaged people not only are discriminated against but also landless poor 
that is a big issue in Eastern civilizations. And that ought to be addressed. The legal and constitutional processes are underway. They haven't gone far enough to address those issues. With this, our session comes to an end. I hope you all had a good time and have a number of key points to take home. I take this opportunity to thank Professor Sabedi and our guest of honor, Srimati Roshan Khanal, for her presence and taking out time out of a busy schedule. A token of gratitude to the Nehru Center, Director Amish Tripathi ji, Nehru Center's administrative staff, and the technical team for all their support. Last but not the least, I thank you, our very attentive and inquisitive audience. Um, and I invite you all to continue our discussions over refreshments downstairs. We also have the flyers of the book with a discount code available if you wish to order a copy of the book. A copy of an article of Professor Subedi directly relevant to one of the chapters of the book are also available as takeaway from the event. Once again, thank you all for your presence, your questions, and your shared commitment to understanding the interesting intersection of human rights and civilization. Thank you.